Good afternoon. Welcome to a um, seminar hosted by the University of Manchester's Institute for Data Science and AI. I'm Julia Handel. I'm a professor in Decision Sciences in Alliance Manchester Business School. Um, so the University of Manchester's Institute for Data Science and AI was created to act as an access point to the university's expertise in data science and artificial intelligence, facilitating interaction between our researchers and problem holders and owning the university's data science strategy. Um, and this seminar today is actually hosted in partnership with the Innovation District Manchester and also our new Turing Innovation Catalyst. And it's held as part of the official AI Fringe, which is a series of events that are being organized around the UK's Government AI Safety Summit next week. Um, before I move to the most important part of my introduction, um, just a quick um, uh, the comment on the fire alarm, so there are no fire drills planned for today, so if we do get a fire alarm, then it's the real thing, and then Lauren will stand up and we all need to follow her. That's all I know about fire safety. Um, okay, so, so that's enough in terms of introductions. Um, the main event today is to welcome our speaker, Petra Velikovic, um, who's a staff research scientist at Google DeepMind and also an affiliated lecturer at the University of Cambridge. Um, and so he's done um, a, a variety of work in the area of machine learning, particularly with graph um, neural net networks. Um, and today he's going to talk to us about the rich and vibrant area of graph rewiring. So he's going to dig in some detail into how we can better formulate machine learning problems that involve graphs by actually considering whether the graphs that are given to us in the problem are the best possible starting point for machine learning and thinking about how we can then actually those impro improve those to obtain better results. Um, I'm sure he'll give a much better introduction to that than me, but um, uh, that's all I have to say. And I'd like to welcome Peter to the stage. All right. Thanks so much for the introduction, Yulia, and thank you all for uh, coming to my talk today. That I must say that was a very good summary of pretty much everything I'm going to say. So hopefully there'll still be something interesting in the next half hour or so for all of you. Uh, but yes, my name is Petar Velichkovic. I'm a staff research scientist at Google DeepMind and an affiliate lecturer at the University of Cambridge. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about, in my opinion, one of the most interesting but also simultaneously important unsolved problems in graph representation learning that has often, you know, kept me up at night thinking about uh, how are the best ways in which we can tackle this problem. And I'll actually, like we'll see a bit further in this talk, I feel like resolving this question will not just help a lot graph representation learning, but actually has the potential to be transformative to all of deep learning in general. So let's uh, set some preliminaries before we dive into the topic of what do we even mean by computational graphs and input graphs and decoupling them. So first of all, I need to, like, I know some of you in the audience might already be familiar with these models, but uh, even for you, it might be helpful to start from the beginning just to set the stage uh, and like a common notation so that when I introduce a symbol, it won't feel weird when I've introduced that symbol. So the main machine learning model that this talk is going to be about is the graph neural network or GNN. It is the standard workhorse machine learning method when processing data that lives on graphs, which are non-trivially structured objects. And they're very interesting because they're very general. You can represent pretty much anything you encounter and put in a computer as a graph. So if we build good GNNs, that can have good ramifications on uh, pretty much uh, all of deep learning. And the way for the understanding of this talk, the main thing you need to know about GNNs is on a high level how they operate. So here we have a graph with just a bunch of nodes connected together by edges. So this can be any kind of network, like say a social network or a road transportation network or something like this. And you have data about each one of these nodes represented as this uh, vector, XB in this case for node B. And uh, the way in which a graph neural network operates is it looks at the data we have on a particular node and all of its uh, first order neighbors in the graph. And based on that, all of that data, it figures out how to update these features to some uh, 
uh, some different representation and maybe do some predictions. And as long as you design this uh, graph neural network function f to be uh, what we call permutation invariant, which means giving you the same answers no matter what order you choose to present these neighbors to the model, this is a valid graph neural network. And pretty much all graph neural networks we're going to be dealing with today are going to look like this. Now, of course, this just tells you on a high level node B features of its immediate neighbors. And how does a message passing model operate? It first computes these message vectors that are sent across from every neighbor to the receiver node. That's the application of this function psi over here. Then once you have all of the messages, what do you do? You collect them in the receiver node using some aggregation function O plus. And whenever you see O plus, you can just think this is any well-behaved aggregation function. So like think this could be a sum of all the messages, it could be average, could be maximum, anything which doesn't depend on the order of the operands is okay. And then finally, once you've collected all the messages, you can further transform them with another function phi. And these functions here, the psi and the phi, are the main things that you learn when you train a deep learning system like this. Everything else is just grounded in the data flow of a model like this. Now, it might not feel this way, but this function is remarkably general. You can use it to describe pretty much all popular machine learning systems in use today, including transformers, as we will discuss later today. So it's remarkably powerful. And I'll just briefly remark that once you understand how to build a one-hop message passing neural network, you can solve pretty much any problem on a graph you care about. To illustrate this on a high level, imagine you have an input graph with features in the nodes and some adjacency structure, which we typically denote with an adjacency matrix. You run your graph neural network over this input, and what, what it will do, as we just discussed, is it will look at the immediate neighborhoods of every node to predict what some updated feature spaces are, these H's. And usually, at least in the basic formulation, it will leave the adjacency matrix intact, although we will challenge that assumption in our talk today. And once you have these updated features, H, for every node, what can you do with them? Well, if your task involves classifying each node separately, you can learn a classifier over the nodes. So for example, if your nodes are documents and edges between them are citation links, you can use a system like this to predict a topic for every single document or classify future documents. You can also classify entire graphs, and this is where arguably some of the most popular applications of GNNs have happened, both industrially and scientifically. You just need to be careful that the output you get doesn't depend on the order in which you feed the nodes. So as you would expect, you need to transform these node vectors into a common representation using like a sum or av average or something like this, and then feed that into a classifier. This pipeline over here has helped us in drug discovery to discover brand new antibiotics that completely escaped the eyes of human chemists uh, by analyzing a bunch of candidate molecules and whether or not they inhibit bacterial growth. So input is molecule, output is does this molecule inhibit the growth of bacteria. So here your nodes will be atoms and your edges will be chemical bonds. And similarly, you can also do predictions over the edges, or if you're in something like a knowledge graph, you can predict whether edges even exist or not, and that is link prediction. So here you build a classifier over the features of the two nodes that are incident to this possible edge, and maybe any edge features you might have on top of that. And this is, for example, the backbone of recommender systems. This is how Amazon recommends which products you should buy next. This is how Pinterest recommends which content you should look at next. This is how, um, uh, what else is good? Airbnb recommends where you should stay next. This is how Uber Eats recommends which food you should eat next. You have a graph where nodes are people and either places to stay or food to eat or anything. And a system like this predicts, should there be an edge between this person and uh, this other person or this place or this food? This is how all of those systems are basically built. Now, as you might be able to tell from the enthusiasm of this introduction, I am a really big fan of graph machine learning. I've worked many years in this area and have published a lot of works in this area, and I love talking about them. However, the talk today is not really going to be about how you build powerful graph neural networks. And as much as it pains me to say this, I cannot really tell you much more about GNNs in this talk. But that being said, I've talked about GNNs a lot, and some of those talks have been publicly made available, including this particular talk, which I gave at the University of Cambridge Wednesday seminar, 
which is a one hour talk just about the foundations of GNNs. So if you want to learn more about how to build these systems and how to deploy them in interesting applications, this talk is highly recommended. It's publicly available on YouTube, easily searchable under this name, and it already has about 70,000 views. So I would say the community is reasonably confident that there's no mistakes in there, okay? So hopefully this is a good reference if what I've said at the beginning of this talk or the applications I mentioned at the beginning of this talk are interesting. But today we're actually gonna consider something different. So let me just for a brief moment, go a few steps back to the equation that I showed you uh, in GNNs. So you are passing certain messages on a graph structure. So you have some nodes and you have some neighbors and using the edges, you determine what the neighbors are. But this equation basically assumes that you know the neighbors for every single node. And that's kind of given to you at the beginning. You have some you know, ground truth, God given graph structure that you're going to use, right? So that's the kind of a seemingly innocent assumption that most GNNs assume, that you have a graph and that graph structure is given to you. But we will actually unpack in the next few slides that this claim is actually pretty far from innocent and unpacking it will lead us into a very dynamic and important area of machine learning today, which is known as graph rewiring. And arguably, this is an area of high interest to science. Like if you really wanna be able to do scientific research on inputs that look like graphs, it's really important to determine what are the true connections between parts of your data which drive a particular system behavior. So in reality, you need to figure out what is the graph between your variables to do science. So if you're not just satisfied with getting a high accuracy on a particular problem, but also understanding why you can get high accuracy, something like this is really important. And actually another treat for the people who are fans of architectures like transformers or large language models, when we start to study graph rewiring, it will just by design reveal really cool connections between some state of the art models and graph neural networks. Spoiler alert, pretty much everything is a graph neural network as you might expect. So. Let me first stress on you why it might be a good idea for us to change an input graph, even if that input graph is perfect, okay? So let's imagine for the sake of the argument, I have built some graphs, so some collection of nodes and edges, and I want to be able to answer questions of the form, given two nodes, does there exist a path between them? So are they connected in the graph? I hope you can imagine how, if I'm being particularly adversarial, I can create a graph which looks like this, like a huge path between the two nodes. And now my graph neural network to figure out that these two are connected has to cover a long path to figure out that there is a connection between these two. It has no choice but to follow the edges of the graph and it takes that many steps of computation before it can figure it out. And this is, you know, there's nothing wrong about this graph. This graph is exactly the graph on which you're asking the question, but there's something suboptimal about it, right? Now, for those of you who are from who come from theoretical computer science, you might know that there is actually a much better way to answer a question like this, and that is to organize your edges in a slightly different way. Now, these edges uh, from this data structure known as a disjoint set union don't necessarily have anything to do with the edges in the original graph, but they allow you to very quickly check which nodes are in the same connected component, so which nodes are together. And the way it works is for all the nodes that are connected together, you will have one tree like this representing that connected component. And the root of the tree is responsible for that entire component. So now you can quickly ask, are two nodes connected? You just check whether their roots are the same, right? If they are, yes. If not, well, no. And if you need to connect two nodes, you find their respective roots and you make one root a child of the other. That way you've connected automatically all the nodes from one subgraph to another subgraph, right? And what's also really cool about this, if you assume that you will never remove edges, only add them, once you've done a query like this for like nodes B and G, I can do an optimization that like immediately compresses all the nodes that I encounter on these paths to just directly point to the roots. So maybe initially I had to traverse a long path, but then in the future I can just do one hop checks, right? So it's actually provable that if you organize your edges in this way, your complexity, the number of steps you need to answer these questions goes down from linear, which is number of nodes in the graph, to basically constant. So no matter how big the graph gets, if you organize your edges in this way, which is very different from the input graph's edges, you're actually going to get much higher efficiency and you'll need to run your model for way less to get the answers you need. So this is one example. Now let me show you a converse example. Sometimes, you know, graph neural networks are really powerful models. They can be trained to recognize all sorts of fun things on a graph. However, they 
some, for some graphs, GNNs are going to be in a terrible situation no matter how well you train them. So we have results in the optimal case, like no matter how good you train the model, it's not going to perform well if the graph structure has some pathological effects. And one very common example that we study in the field is the example of bottlenecks. So here, for example, you have two heavily connected communities in your graph. You can imagine this as two different communities in a social network. And somebody from community one just happens to be connected to somebody in the community two. So in case you want information to flow from one community to the other, this edge is now under a lot of pressure. It has to carry a lot of information. Because for every node in here, it has to meaningfully be the conduit of its information to every other node in here. And you can actually prove that when you have a graph that's bottlenecked like this, your graph neural network to enable all pairs of nodes to communicate needs exponentially increasing state in the number of nodes. So this is basically a practical impossibility statement. Like on graphs like this, you can never hope to have good communication between all pairs of nodes in the communities, no matter how well you train your model. So this is an impossibility statement, okay? So choosing the right graph, even if it's perfectly correct, might make or break how easily you can learn the function you want to learn, let alone anything else. So just to kind of summarize these beginning points that we went through. Even if you have a perfectly correct graph, it might not be the best graph for the task that you're solving. We looked at the path querying example where both of these graphs were fully correct to encode the information you need to answer whether two nodes are connected. The first graph requires you to run linearly many layers, so a number that grows as you increase the size of the graph. The other one induces basically constant time layers. So no matter how big your graph gets, it will always be a small amount of effort. And this was all under the assumption that you had a perfect graph to begin with. I need to stress, in the real world, perfect graphs are incredibly rare. And let me start by giving you an example that you might think is perfect just, you know, if you're in the field and you work with this. Almost everybody who comes into graph representation learning, the area of machine learning focused on graphs, will start by studying molecules because molecules just happen to be a very nice graph data structure of atoms and bonds, which feels like it's given to us by nature, like it just feels correct, right? But it is only a chemical approximation, okay? It is not a correct graph for the underlying physics all pairs of atoms interact. They don't have to have a chemical bond between them that's arbitrarily drawn to have some effects between them. And this effect becomes very pronounced if you want to do something like modeling proteins, which are huge molecules. This is an area of recent success for DeepMind with the AlphaFold model as well. As you might know, a protein is a linear, basically linear molecule, where more or less the different parts of the protein are arranged in a sequence. So the graph is actually a really long chain of all of these things. But actually, what gives the protein its power is the fact that this sequence then rolls up on itself in 3D space, folds, and now suddenly things that were super far away in the input graph, in the chemical graph, are really close together in 3D space. And arguably, this proximity, the interactions there, are what drives the function of the protein and can be the cause of both successful behavior of cells, but also, if it's done wrongly, the cause of many diseases, right? So understanding where all of these effects come from requires us to think about connections which are super far away in the input protein graph. So if you were to run a GNN on just the input protein graph, even though it's a nice chemical approximation, it's actually a terrible approximation for any kind of physics-based or proximity-based problem. And AlphaFold leverages this, this quite a bit by allowing protein residues to interact even if they're really far away in the chain, but really close in 3D space. And as we said in the bottleneck example, some graphs are just pathologically bad. So if you have a graph with bottlenecks in it or something, and you really care about the different communities communicating with each other, no matter how good that graph, how good your GNN gets, no matter how good of a training procedure you come up with, communication might be impossible across all pairs. And this is a property of the graph structure. It doesn't depend on the machine learning model that you use on it. Okay. And arguably, choosing a computation graph might give us the final building block we need to build all of discrete deep learning. Now, what do I mean by this? When you put data in a computer, a computer cannot represent continuous data. You have to discretize it in one way or another. And once you discretize the data, a graph is just a really nice abstraction for pretty much anything you want to do with this data, because it's a nice way to represent objects, discrete objects, and connections between them. And we actually recently have conjectured that uh, 
this model I gave you, the one hop message passing layer I gave you, is powerful enough to represent pretty much anything you care about with a small caveat. What do I mean by this caveat? Let's imagine I take any valid neural network over this graph. I call it GNN to just refer to it's a neural network over that graph. So over a graph G and some features X, and it has some parameters theta that you learn when you do machine learning. We argue that this GNN, no matter how cleverly you build it, no matter how smartly it hacks the graph structure, is the same as if you first rewire the graph in a smart way, and then you do the one hop message passing rule that I showed you before. So if you are clever enough about how you modulate your computation graph, you can get away with a one hop message passing rule almost all the time. And recently we're starting to see theoretical proofs of this fact in certain special cases. If you want to know more about this, Francesco Di Giovanni gave a fantastic keynote at one of the Europe's workshops last year. So take a look at that if you want to know more about this deep connection. But let's say currently it's a very strong but reasonably accepted conjecture that if you choose the right graph, you're, you don't have to invent anything else. The one hop message passing model that already exists might be sufficient for anything you might want to do over this data. So hopefully, at least some of the examples I've showed you, no matter your prior experience or prior interests in graph machine learning, hopefully at least some of the examples I've showed you convince you that it might be a good idea to consider changing the graph that's given to us. So let's start thinking about how can we rewire a graph. And let's think about it from the perspective that's even more brutal than what I started with initially. Let's assume you just have a collection of nodes and no graph. How do you decide what's a graph between those nodes? Well, maybe a pessimistic or somewhat silly first thing to do, but it is a completely valid first thing to do, is to just assume if I've given you no edges, there are no edges, right? So what does this mean practically? This now means you have just a collection of nodes and they're only allowed to talk to themselves. There's no interconnect between them. Now, if you plug this into the GNN equations I showed you before, assuming that the neighborhood of node i is just i itself, this amounts to, for any GNN flavor you want, into a very simple equation where features of each node are just a direct function of the input features of that node, and that's it. And this is actually a really famous model in deep learning. It's known as deep sets. Uh, well, models like this have been studied for decades, but we call it deep sets nowadays in honor of the eponymous paper from Manzel, Zahir, and others, which proved lots of really cool properties about this model. I must stress, even if you go for the deep sets option, it is remarkably powerful, and for some problems, it might be exactly what you need. But of course, uh, it is a very pessimistic option, which ignores the possible wealth of data between these pairs of nodes that you have here. So naturally, if you have one option to assume no edges, does anyone have an idea of what else we can do? Any thoughts? Yes, assume everything is connected, which I like to call the lazy approach, right? So you know there's some connections, but you don't want to bother figuring them out yourself. You want to let the machine learning model figure them out by itself. So now what I do is neighborhood of each node is the collection of all of the nodes. And now all of the nodes are influencing my representation and the model can kind of figure out which nodes are more important than others as it, as it gets trained. And if I plug a particular flavor of GNNs, the GNNs that use attentional mechanisms into an equation like this, I hopefully get an equation that should feel familiar to some of you. Does anybody recognize what model this is? Yes, exactly. This is the transformer. Now this might feel like a potentially coincidental find, but actually it's a very deep connection. Transformers, which are the current backbone of large language models and pretty much all the famous machine learning models people talk about nowadays, are actually a special case of graph neural networks. If you run a graph neural network over a fully connected graph of word tokens and you make it attentionally flavored, you recover exactly the transformer architecture. Now, of course, you might be wondering, hang on, but why are we talking about transformers in the context of graphs? Aren't they working with language? Isn't language a sequence rather than a graph? Well, when you think about it, for those of you who are familiar with transformers, how do we tell a transformer that it's looking at a sequence? We tell it that by giving input features, these positional embeddings, but those are just features. They have nothing to do with the architecture. The model can decide to use them. It can decide to ignore them. In reality, the symmetries and the way in which the model operates is graph structured. It's learning arbitrary connections between words rather than the sequential order of the word, which is hinted to it, but it doesn't have to use it. And you can also imagine attention mechanism in transformers as a method to infer a soft adjacency. So like a soft graph that you're using to figure out something about the words. 
And another way to look at it, because the way transformers are implemented with the full graph, this uh, lends itself very nicely to lots of dense matrix multiplications. And as you might know, matrix multiplications, especially dense ones, are really easy to write and parallelize on modern hardware, like GPUs and TPUs. So basically, transformers are a really well-positioned graph neural network that is both capable of figuring out soft graphs and scaling up really easily on current hardware. So I often like to think of transformers as graph neural networks that are currently winning the hardware lottery, right? In the future, we might have better hardware optimized for sparse communication, where these more fine-grained GNNs might have a much bigger chance to shine. And this is a very deep and intricate connection that I really like talking about, but once again, it is not the central topic of this talk, so I cannot dwell on it for too long. But if anything I said on this slide, and if you're interested in transformers and how they connect to these models interests you, there is this really fantastic blog post from Chaitanya Joshi, who is a PhD student at Cambridge right now, that was published in the gradient of, at, in the year 2020. And it's easy to find. You just Google for this sentence, transformers or graph neural networks. That's the name of the paper. So if you want to learn more in this blog post, Chaitanya like really takes a deep dive into different parts of a transformer, different parts of a GNN, and explicitly connecting the different parts together. So if you want a detailed mathematical reason for why this is deeply connected, rather than just taking my word for it based on the previous analysis, I invite you to read this. Okay? So we covered the two, I guess, maybe obvious choices, right? Either assume there's nothing there or assume everything is there and kind of let the model work its way out. But both of these approaches, they feel a bit underwhelming, and we will discuss during this talk why exactly they feel underwhelming. So one other thing you can do is, okay, let's assume it's not nothing, it's not everything, but there is something in the middle. There's some graph structure we would like to use or change in our input graphs. And the first way to do this is through what we call non-parametric rewiring. And what I mean by this is, let's say you have a graph structure, which is not particularly good. This graph structure here, for example, is not very good because it's a, it's a tree-like structure with many bottlenecks. And we just discussed bottlenecks are bad. If you cut any of these edges from the graph, you disconnect half of the graph. It's really bad. So you might apply a rewiring technique that uh, adds some extra edges to make the process a bit easier for your graph network, and then you run the graph network over this rewired graph, okay? This is what we mean in essence by non-parametric rewiring. I must stress, this is also really popular in transformers as well nowadays. Whenever you want to run large language models on huge uh, word contexts, like hundreds of thousands of tokens, you cannot do full attention. You cannot do n squared edges because 100,000 squared doesn't fit in memory. So what do people do? They choose which edges to compute attention over and which edges to just say are zero. And what are they doing effectively? They're rewiring the transformer graph. That's what it's doing. Now, of course, if there's non-parametric, there's also parametric, and we often call that latent graph inference in the field. And here, it's really the same picture as before, but the main difference is that here we had some algorithm that like just gives you a graph structure based on some graph theoretic knowledge. Whereas here, you can actually do machine learning to figure out what are the edges that are missing. So there's some learnable model for rewiring that figures out extra edges based on both the input graph and potentially the features you have in your nodes. Arguably, this approach is the most powerful one, but it has a problem of you have one model that chooses edges for another model. This is not differentiable. So it's really tricky to back propagate through all of this and learn a good model to do this. It's really tricky, it often induces really complicated multi level learning loops. So basically, let's summarize the pros and cons of all the four directions. With deep sets, you assume no edges, so you're ignoring a wealth of information potentially. With transformers, you get a nice and scalable model which uh, works over potentially very diverse situations, but it is actually really hard to scale in terms of once you're past a certain point, say 100,000 or so, you certainly cannot do 100,000 squared. That will not fit in the memory of the systems we have right now. And also, we will discuss this much more, it's harder to generalize in the sense that uh, once you train a transformer to operate on a certain collection of objects, if you've played with large language models in recent months, you have noticed this. If you ask them a big enough problem, they will collapse and fail to give you an answer. Or even worse, they will try to be helpful and hallucinate an answer that has nothing to do with what you've asked them. So these models are really not that good if you show them, like in training data, three or four objects, and then asking them something about six objects, they tend to not really cope well with those situations, partly because of the fully connected graph assumption. 
And latent graph inference, even though it's maybe morally the best approach we should be doing, it also has a lot of discrete decisions that you have to figure out how to do machine learning over. So it's quite tricky. Non-parametric rewiring just happens to hit that sweet spot where there's nice mathematical theory we can use to explain why a certain graph has been chosen. And it's a nice and scalable method. You can just process all of your graphs at the beginning and then just run your GNN as you normally would on the rewired graph structure. So there's lots of good reasons why we should focus on this space. And for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to focus on this space. So we talk about non-parametric graph rewiring. So it's a procedure where we have an input graph and we modify the edges of that input graph based on, um, based on some property that we wouldn't like to see or would like to see in the graph. So let's talk about, I'm going to tell you three broad strategies how we are currently trying to do this in the field of graph machine learning. The first one, which uh, was a fairly early approach in machine learning terms, published at NeurIPS 2019, the graph diffusion convolution. It's, you know, taking a fairly perhaps obvious, but a very worth exploring uh, perspective of if you need more edges to put in your graph, maybe a good place to look for them is the input graph itself. Like maybe the input graph informs you on what are good connections to include. And that's basically what approaches like this do. They do some diffusion approaches like personalized page rank in this particular case to figure out what are some interesting shortcut edges I could add which shortcut paths in the original graph. And this approach worked remarkably well. On many standard data sets, expanding your edges in this way works remarkably well for downstream performance. It's quite elegant, easy to describe, and versatile. But as we said, a great place is to look for the input graph itself. It's sort of subtly expecting that the input graph is already good. And here by good, we mean uh, in graph machine learning terms, homophilic, which means that the edges you have in your graph are likely to connect related quantities. So say in a social network, if you are expecting that your friends will have similar interests as you, right? If this assumption is satisfied, then you can use a diffusive approach like this to get really good quality edges. If your graph is not good, there's lots of bias or other properties in it. Uh, like if you have uh, friends with you on the social network that don't have the same interests as you, then expanding in this way will just perpetuate those biases and that's a bad thing. Also, you might be potentially adding a lot of new edges, which drastically changes the statistics of the graph. So there's lots of reasons why this approach might not be the best one. So in response to that, uh, the group from Oxford, uh, 